So just to introduce you, Helen, Helen's had over 25 years of experience working in heritage and conservation in the, in the private and the public sector, um, worked as a conservation officer, worked as an English heritage inspector, um, and is going to talk to us today about uh, the challenges of reusing vacant listed shops. So exactly uh, leading on from um, Ian's presentation about some of the, the particular challenges for for um, our historic building. So thank you, Helen. Sorry, we're running a few seconds late. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my screen now. I never quite yeah. know because I've got a split screen. So I sometimes yes, we end up looking at different things. But anyway, um, one of the things I wanted to I've had I've had some really interesting conversations with Ian over the last sort of um, six months. And one of the things that he's explained to me, which I'm not sure kind of massively came out in his presentation, but perhaps everyone else picked up on it, but I'll just reiterate it, is that it's gen that generally one of the big problems is that it's no one's responsibility. So I'm interested that people are saying, but what about planning? Um, you know, I'm a planning officer, what can I do? And what about enforcement? And, and they're, they're answers that we have for slightly different questions. And until it's someone's responsibility, it seems to me that it's always going to be really hard to make progress because it's it's not quite a planning issue and it's not quite an enforcement issue and it's not quite a conservation officer's issue. But all of those people have some of the tools to unlock these problems and to and to move things forward. So I just wanted to sort of um, to, to just mention that before I started. So Nels asked me to talk about um, particularly listed buildings and, and heritage issues and the, and the, and the ch particular challenges that they bring. Um, when we're thinking about the reusing of vacant listed shops. So I'm just going to run through some, uh, some. So it, you, you may already know the answer to, to this, you may have heard this before, but I'll just run through it so that we're all on the same page. So the first question is, why are listed buildings different? And they are, of course, different because they're protected by law and under policy, um, because they have historic features which contribute to our understanding of place and history because these features enable us to understand the past and they provide a unique character for the present and the future. They're very often one of the main reasons that we love individual places. They're valued by the public and they help to reinforce local distinctiveness, which is also beneficial for healthy high streets. However, they are a finite resource and once gone, they are of course gone forever and that's recognised in, in law and policy. So the next question is, why do they become vacant? And of course, the reasons for vacancy are as varied as the buildings themselves. And, and Ian's very well articulated point about understanding the backstory to every building applies just as well to this. It's just the answer will be slightly different in terms of them being listed. And what makes them special to us can also make them seem or perhaps be difficult to reuse, especially in the absence of clear and bespoke advice. Um, as has already been mentioned, they are likely to cost more to repair or fit out. Um, the specialist repairs in terms of things like lime plaster or lath and plaster and things like that. It is more expensive. There's no question about that. So whilst um, they're sort of fundamentally quite adaptable spaces, the demolition and rebuilding may be more attractive economically um, and developers may think that leaving them vacant may increase the chance of this. Note lots of mays because, of course, as Ian says, you have to understand the backstory and it may be that that's not quite the case but i think in some cases that is what people think that if they if they leave them to fall down um you know they may be able to redevelop the the site it really seems to me that this this point that i made to start with about the fact that um we're all saying is it is it you know i, I i've got planning you know tools available to me because i'm a planning officer it, what role do I play in this? I'm a conservation officer, I've got heritage policy at my disposal, what role do I play in this? It seems to me that so often everyone's actually talking past each other. The landlord, the lessee, the council and sometimes the conservation officer are not really um, forming the partnerships that we've been hearing about as, as being kind of critical to the success. So why do they stay vacant? Again, um, th th this this comes back to the to understanding the backstory, but it seems to me that it's around these issues, difficult trading conditions, um, lack of incentives, buildings falling into disrepair and then that cost potentially spiraling, significance not understood. Now that's a really key thing that we're gonna come back to. Sometimes the planning system actually um, 
assists in them remaining vacant and the planning and conservation system rather than helping. And there may, of course, be other units which are easier to reuse. And it seems to me that what could glue all these things back together is specific and bespoke advice, which is geared towards reuse. So let's look for a minute at heritage protection. If you're going to make a listed building consent application, it seems to me that as a basic, you need to understand what the process is that you're entering, how it works and what other people want out of it. And that's the same whether you're a large scale developer um, in a town centre or whether you're um, a, um, a residential household owner who wants an extension to their listed building. You have to understand this. And more often than not, when we're asked to come in and kind of help sort out a problem, it's because people don't understand this. They don't understand the process that they're going into. They don't really understand how it works. And they certainly don't really understand that there's a kind of push and pull and that other people want something specific out of it. And in particular, it's really important to understand what the conservation officer both wants and needs to have in order to be able to determine the application and how to present it to them in a way which actually resonates with them. Um, people also need to understand what the policies are and how they might begin to satisfy them with their own specific development. And in heritage terms, this all starts with an understanding of significance. Now, significance is a word that I seem to use about 50 million times a day, although I still can't spell it. Um, and it, it, it's worth just looking at what is significance. So significance, which I mean, is it, <laughs> You know, I've been around long enough now to remember all, all the different words that became came before significance, but significance and we, we might refer to it as heritage value or special character is what makes a building or a place unique or valuable or important or cherished or perhaps might might contribute to an academic understanding of um, of what is interesting in heritage terms about a place. So it's a sort of. It's a monster with many different faces, I suppose. Is it a monster? No, it's a it's a nice thing with many different faces, but they all sort of amount to the same thing. Um, and, and in trying to use these different words like unique, valuable, important, cherished, academically interesting, I'm trying to get to the idea that um, there is a general consensus of what is heritage importance or significance. Understanding significance is key to unlocking the listed building consent process. Um, and therefore understanding significance and correctly explaining the impact of proposals on significance is the absolute key to unlocking the reuse of any listed building, but, in, but specifically including vacant shop units. So one of the things that Nell asked me to talk about is what can you do to a listed building? Now, this is a vexed and um, tricky to answer question, but I will try and uh, run through it. It's not really possible to answer what you can do to a listed building outside of a discussion of significance. And I'll give you an example of that. As a company, we've done a lot of work in Covent Garden, which where most of the buildings are listed, not all of them, and it is in a conservation area in, in central London. Now, Covent Garden was developed from the late 17th century onwards um, with significant alterations and improvements as the first leases fell in. So about 100 years afterwards. So we've got lots and lots of kind of later 18th century buildings. Now, some of those buildings are remarkably pristine, actually, given their location. Uh, some of them are in poor condition or were in poor condition. Um, so we've we've got it. We've and some of them have been very very altered to the point where they've sort of been rebuilt behind a retained facade. So walking down the street, you can't really tell from looking at the outside which ones are really good inside and really unaltered, and which ones are actually lots of concrete and steel beams. So in the ones which have been very altered, it's always easier to get listed building consent for. Um, further alterations, particularly to the upstairs floors, if there's if there's not very much historic fabric left. But in the ones where you go in and there's there's 18th century staircases, some of them really beautifully carved. There's 18th century panelling, all that sort of thing. It's going to be much harder to to you know the, the council are not going to want to see the loss of those features quite understandably. So the only way that you can that you can understand what you can do to a listed building is to understand what makes it significant. But it has to be said, and you you need to bear in mind that that what would be considered a sort of standard alteration to a, a normal, in inverted commas, building would need listed building consent and it may not be granted. 
for example, as I was just talking about, the removal of his, his important historic features, including windows, internal walls, fireplaces, staircases, floorboards, ceilings, plain lath and plaster. So not even necessarily, you know, um, decorated plaster surfaces, but plain lath and plaster, chimneys, chimney breasts, all that kind of thing are likely to be resisted because these contribute to the significance um, and the understanding of the building. So changes must respect and retain what makes a building historically interesting and important. And now that I've seen all this slide up, I've realised that I haven't begun to answer the question about what you can do to a listed building because you sort of can't really. Um, Upper floors are obviously, uh, you know, a really big issue. And even where there's reasonably high um, occupancy rates on the ground floor, the upper floors are very often uh, either underused or completely vacant. And that's even given that um, about, someone will correct me on the dates here, but I think it was about 25 years ago, English Heritage introduced a scheme called LOTS, Living Over the Shops. And it was about, as the name suggests, trying to get um, more residential occupation on the upper floors of um, historic towns and cities. And it was quite successful. But even in the wake of that, there are still there's still lots of underused and or vacant um, space in our towns and, and cities on the upper floors. Um, and as a result of that, they're very often in quite poor condition. So it's, it's really common. I mean, I live quite near Chipping Norton and, I'm, and I can think of a really good couple of examples where the ground floor shops are used. You know, that's fine. That's no problem. But you go upstairs and they've got really, you know, some in one case, a 17th century decorated plaster ceiling, which is which is um, or was falling down. Um, because of this sort of lack of use and also, I suppose, a lack of investment, they can often be quite um, historically interesting and you can you can find some really great features on the upper floors. But it seems to me that it's reasonable and, and indeed important to bring them back into viable economic use. Although I've seen examples of where this has happened and then the shop unit has struggled for storage and staff rooms. But you have to bear in mind that the same listed building consent restrictions would apply and alterations need to be brought forward in the context of what's significant about these particular spaces. But of course, it's possible to think about residential use, additional commercial floor space or a separate commercial unit in some cases. Um, but bearing in mind, if you need a separate entrance, um, that's something that needs to be sort of considered very carefully. So I'm just going to now look at um, a handful of examples of, of work that we've done. Um, I think they're mainly Oxford and Oxfordshire. Um, so this is a, uh, a former Nat West, Grade 2 listed on the High Street in Oxford. It's actually just up the road from our office. Um, and the photograph has cleverly been taken such that there's a bus in front of um, the ground floor windows on the left hand side. Um, vacant listed banks are a big issue. You know, they're, ve they're very often like this. They don't really have a shop front. Um, they've got great um, sort of banking fit outs inside, which can make them quite difficult to use and all the rest of it. Anyway, this had become vacant and had been vacant for, in or probably know the answer, I can't remember how long, a couple of years at least. Um, but originally this was actually two units. It was built as the bank on the right hand side and a music shop on the left hand side. And in the 1950s, some sort of plain kind of Gothic style windows to match the rest of the building were put in and the shop front taken out. Um, so the proposal was to to reuse the ground floor as a, as a rather smart kind of restaurant and to reuse the upper floors as um, uh, flats. And really the, pro the proposals had sort of become unstuck because mainly because there was a lack of understanding about what the original shop front may have looked like. So the, the proposal was to replace these 1950s windows that are behind the bus with a with a nice shop front but there was no real understanding about what the original shop front looked like. There was also no understanding about what the original layout of the upper floors was. And therefore, when, when the conservation officer was being asked, can we take this wall out? The answer was, well, I don't know what's the significance of that wall. And nobody, you know, it's difficult to get hold of the answer. There were also specific things like where was the stairs from the ground floor to the first floor in the bank? Um, and also the applicant was sort of, would quite like a lift, but nobody could kind of figure out where the best way to where by the best place to put it was so the way that we approach this is the way that we approach all of our projects which is to undertake detailed research into the history and development of the building and in doing that we were able to uncover plans from the 1920s so whilst it was still a music shop and a bank 
uh, which showed how the upper floors were laid out, where the staircase was. It gave us an indication of where a lift could be kind of sensibly accommodated. Um, and then we had to do some some kind of quite intense research to find out to find some photographs of the shop front, which we eventually did it, um, which gave us a really good idea about how to re replicate um, the missing shop front. And it's not it's not exactly as it was, but it's it's not a bad sort of replication. So that was I mean, again, the, the, the unlocking of this building for its commercial reuse hinged on being able to understand and, exp and explain its significance. This building is actually opposite the one that we've just been looking at. Um, it's a very, very complicated building, as you can probably tell by looking at the outside of it. Underneath all that kind of render and stucco, there are timber frames. There's a jetty on the right hand side, which you can sort of tell by the brackets um, holding up the first floor. Uh, the bit that we're looking at is mainly grade two star listed, but across the site there were grade two listed buildings. Um, there were un it's all in the conservation area, so there are cartilage listed buildings. There's there's uh, unlisted buildings that make a positive contribution to the conservation area. The cellars are 13th, 14th century, um, and throughout the site there's 17th, 18th, and 19th century fabric, which is all of significance. Um, now this is one where Understanding the significance of the building was really important to the work that was done to the to the upper floors, but sad to say, the pub on the ground floor still doesn't appear to have um, taken off. And I think there's more work to be done to understand why that is and what can be done about it. But certainly in terms of understanding the significance, that work has been done so that as and when an application is brought forward to refurbish the pub on the ground floor, it seems to me that that could be done fairly confidently in a, in the framework of an understanding of, of the significance of the building. So this one is sort of ongoing. Um, this is, I mean, Burford in, in West Oxfordshire was, was voted about 10 years ago, I think, as being one of the most desirable places to live in the whole of Europe. And it really is a very beautiful Cotswold wool town. Even in Burford, there are too many vacant shop units and there are too many units which have opened and then failed. And I've included this picture. This is actually the upper part um, of the hill in Burford. And you can see the, the variation of amazing buildings. So lots of these are medieval behind their facades. Um, they're very often redressed in the early and mid 18th century with fantastic kind of vernacular approximations of little um, country houses. The one on the far left is a sort of miniature country house on the hill in Burford. However, there are so many applications that come forward in Burford where there is no understanding of the significance of the fabric. And, and the building that we were working at was sort of one, two, three on from, from, the, from the right hand side. Um, so it's got a projecting shop front. Um, and that application was brought forward and there were lots of questions about, well, we want to take out this wall. Well, what is it? Oh, we don't know. So we were brought in to to give a, a really thorough and bespoke appreciation of what is significant about that building. And actually that building and the two units on the which are houses now on the to, to its right are part of, are formed together at what was um, a medieval hall house. So until you understand that that's a medieval hall house, that, which was split in the 18th century into, um, th I think actually it was originally split in the 18th century to two houses. And then in the 19th century, it was further split into three houses. Until you understand that kind of evolution, it's always going to be sort of borderline impossible for the conservation officer to be able to say whether or not something's acceptable. So what are what is the main challenge or what are the main challenges? It seems to me that the kinds of retailers that we really want in places like Central Oxford and in places like Burford are the niche, local, artisanal ones. They don't understand heritage significance, and why would they? If it comes to that, the boots is the I don't know the Waterstones, the the kind of major change, they don't understand significance either. And again, why would they? But it's it's specifically the ones that that I think we really want to attract. They, many people, find the planning and heritage process labyrinthine, expensive, opaque, frustrating and slow. Um, that's not meant to be a criticism of the people who are operating that process, but that is certainly what I find as a consultant 
um, using these services, sometimes I can't explain to my client why it's taken a year for the local authority to come back to us and say that they're going to refuse the application. You know, that's really, really difficult situation to be in. Listed units are definitely more challenging and more expensive to reuse. There's no question about that. But also there seems to me to be no go between or honest broker between the conservation officer and the potential end user. And I sort of like to position ourselves as exactly that. Um, there is it, it's trying to make sure that the conversation which is currently going past everybody is actually engaging um, with people. So what is the potential response? It seems to me that alongside the need for retail unit vacancy to be someone's, i.e. someone specific's problem, there's a need for an upfront understanding of the significance and historic fabric of all vacant listed retail units in a given area, an audit, if you will. And because this falls between the parties, it should be, in my opinion, commissioned by the public sector and supplied to the potential end user to resolve this problem. We're talking about public sector investment in something which benefits the public in the long term. And we need to acknowledge that these buildings cost more to develop, but contribute more potentially to the high street because of their inherent cherished local value. And um, things, you know, Grant schemes like HAZ play a key role in bridging the funding gap, but is it possible for councils or anyone else to do more to bridge this funding gap? And that's it from me. Uh, hopefully not too controversial um, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. That was, it was really interesting. And uh, at the moment, we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, and I would like to oh dear. just just <laughs> say, well, some uh, usually questions come well, a little we, bit. We do uh, have, there are questions in the chat. Oh, gosh, am I missing them completely? Thank you, Helena. Um, yeah, so I think Charles is kind of agreeing with what you, you just said. And he says, my experience of getting engagement from planning, heritage and building control has been slow, contradictory and not focused on facilitating clear guidance. Yeah, yeah. Which has often that, frustrated yeah. progress on bringing buildings back to use. Yeah, How can this nice be made too. more user friendly? Can I just can I just duck in and ask the question, Helen, are you able to stay uh, for, the, for the whole seminar? Would that is that OK? Just thinking I, I can now. Timing. Yes, originally I couldn't, but now I can. Well, that would be great. So if you just want to comment on that and perhaps then we can revisit well, some of the I think, I think the, 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 the question was, how do we how do we make that process sort of more straightforward and less frustrating? It seems to me that it's likely to be more straightforward and less, frustra less frustrating if you understand what everybody is trying to get out of the process. So so obviously planning, conservation and building control are all trying to do slightly different things. So there needs to be somebody who can understand what those slightly different things are and bring them together. Now, the problem is whose responsibility is it, is it to do that? Is it my responsibility as a heritage consultant? Well, I mean, I can do some of it, but I can't do the building control side of it. Um, is it the council's responsibility? It seems to me that what you need is an old fashioned town centre manager who stands between the different parties to say, OK, well, I hear what you want. However, the main aim here is to get this building back into use. So if we understand significance and if we can meet as far as possible planning policy and if we can do as much as we can in terms of building regs, the main aim here is to get this building back into use. And I think that there, in my experience, both in the public and the private sector, there's a lot of silo thinking still. Thank you. I think there's a number that would agree would agree with you there. And um, I would just like at the, that point, following on from Helen's um, Helen sort of call for better understanding. We at the Tawi Centre have been in, in, a, in a very fortunate position to be able to develop uh, a lot of training courses, a number of training courses, uh, which you can see uh, advertised through the Tawi Centre website. Um, and they include heritage impact assessments, so writing those to help understand how to bring out the, the significance of a building um, and also um, listed building consent, talking you through the process of those. So, I, I mean, I, I could talk all day about writing heritage assessments and I won't because it's not the right forum, but I, I agree with you. And the, the standard is pretty low in the sector and yeah. um, poor quality heritage assessments are accepted 
all the time. And what I want to say to people who are involved in, in validating those applications is every time you accept a poor quality heritage assessment, you know, you are doing nobody a favour. They have to be done properly and, and they have to be done in such a way as they make sense. Um, you know, it's it's just you you you, can, you cannot make a decision unless you understand what's significant about the building. So I my my view is that local authorities with a particular problem with vacant listed units should commission this work and have it done up front. There should be a little mini statement of significance for every vacant listed building in a particular area so that the niche so that the cheese maker and the person who I don't know makes their own shoes and sells them or whatever has that information they have that understanding and they can say oh okay so I'm not you know I won't I wouldn't get consent to knock that wall down that's fine we can work around that you know that they, they, have, they, to have, that this, they have to have it up, up front and yeah. the only way to do it is to get somebody to look at these buildings and say what's significant about them now rather than wait for yeah. that to come out of an application yeah Great. Well, thank you very much, Helen. That was really, really You're interesting welcome. and helpful. And I know that there will be more more questions and as they tie tie in with with um, previous and uh, speakers moving as we move forward after the break. 